I turned over a bright metal shell that rippled when She I... says human longing for mystery leads to a commonality of belief in immortality. Dad's late or I'm early. Either way, I have time to scout the pens. Can't... Redemption and claustrophobia, what artists understand. Not valuing the Okay, I'm Jonna Sagey. I'm from Omaha, Nebraska. I was born in Omaha, raised outside of and in Omaha. Um, my father, my grandfather actually farmed outside of Omaha for a long time. So I spent a lot of time on farms and uh, kind of with cattle and horses and animals that time. People always ask me that because they want to know, well, how did you get to know so much about all this? Did you just make it up? And part of it, of course, is made up, but <laughs> the main part of it is actually from experience. I also lived partly um, in Missouri. My parents were from Missouri, and at one point in our lives, we went down there and lived for a couple of years down in the Ozarks. So I have that kind of experience, too, that I draw from. People ask this question, and I, I feel bad about it <laughs> because I, I have to preface this by saying, Knowing you want to be a writer and being any good at it at all are two different things. And I knew I wanted to be a writer from about the age of three or four. I knew I was going, to, I don't know where this idea, how it came into my being, but I, from early on in my life, I told people I was going to be a writer. And I tried to be a writer. I was a terrible writer, honestly. Um, the, I would write these little horse stories and send them off to magazines. I tried to write, I read the Iliad and when I was a kid, and then I tried to write the story of the last horse left over from the Trojan War, you know, and that only, and I was learning to type at the same time as about eight or nine, so, you know, that lasted about two pages. <laughs> but uh, I just knew I was going to do it, and I think it's been, it was a gift to, to have very early, but it didn't necessarily lead me to bloom that early. I didn't really start publishing fiction until I was in my mid to late 30s and uh, my novels start coming out in my late 40s. So actually, I'm not someone who was a 20-year-old genius or a 15-year-old or a genius. I just knew it, and I told everyone, and I, it's that business of dreaming. Eventually, I said it so often that I began to believe it. And I did try. I tried nine different majors in college, trying to, to avoid being, <laughs> doing the thing that I thought I could do, which was writing in English. And, and I thought, well, that's too easy. I can't do that. I should go do something harder like philosophy for which I had no talent <laughs> or, or any course I ever took I tried to major in but it was useless I was I was going to be a writer so that's how it all came about and I just kept doing it and that's mostly what I I tell people who want to be writers the people who become writers are the people the desire is the first thing and then you have to do it for 10 or 20 years and um, eventually Thomas Hart Benton said, the life of the artist is the best there is if you can survive the first 40 years. And I think that's about it. It's true. Okay, I've survived <laughs> so far, so I think I'm doing it. Well, I have a BA from the University of Iowa in English and Creative Writing and an MA and PhD from SUNY Binghamton, which is the State University of New York at Binghamton. And I did a creative dissertation, which was a 90-page poem that became my first book called Houses. And that was a book that explored family dramas and history and secrets that I needed to find out about. And it, it uh, combined historical material uh, from our family books, um, letters from my mother describing her history. And she was quite a, a fantasy kind of oriented person. <laughs> so it was another version of history I enjoyed. And a lot of natural um, material that I generated into poetry. So it kind of was, I guess I was always going toward fiction in that sense. I always found the, the poem, I began life as a poet, and I found the poem, the lyric poem, kind of confining. So I decided to have this long poem with all these different voices speaking. So I was on my way to fiction, just didn't realize it for about 10 years. I would say Faulkner probably is the biggest influence. Uh, Mary Sandoz, whom I encountered when I was in my 20s, was a big influence in terms of what she was able to do with Nebraska in Western material, which I was really interested in. And that I remember reading her biography of Crazy Horse and just being completely stunned. I had read Catherine in high school, but I didn't connect at that point with Catherine so much. I think, um, I don't know why actually, 
but Sandoz, I think there was a world there that I did understand. She was writing more directly out of the Sandhills, which I knew nothing about at that point. I didn't know that that was going to become the place that I would um, eventually move my imagination to. And I think writers like um, Dickens has always been a big influence. He's very funny. He's, um, he's a tough critic of society, and, and I've always had that urge also. And I like the way he, he took on current social issues, and I try to do that in my novels. And I think Flannery O'Connor and uh, Eudora Welty, I, I kind of have mostly identified with Southern writers, and I don't know why, perhaps because of my family's history. We had ancestors who fought on both sides of the Civil War, so they actually fought each other probably also, since they came from a divided state, the state of Missouri. So that was basically how I grew up, and all the poets I could get my hands on, basically, because I've always loved poetry. And I think I learned a lot about language from poetry. And I, I always tell my, my writing students, the young ones, that it's very important to take poetry classes, even if you know you want to be a fiction writer, because you have to learn something about the language. You have to listen to the cadence. You have to figure out image and metaphor and, and the, the power of economy and, and the compactness of a poem. And then you stretch that out when you add character and setting and drama. Well. I'm not, the intensity of my characters I think comes from the fact that, that I grew up in a very intense household. Um, they had lots of mental problems and, and all the emotions were out there. And so I just experienced life, you know, at a level of intensity that I think maybe some people don't. There were a lot of edges in, in my life early on and, and continued to be. And the other aspect I think of my characters is that, um, I, I'm not sure why, but I've, I, um, it's what I call Hitler's dog. <laughs> you know, that, that thing that when I, when I teach writing, I talk about the fact that, that true all-out evil isn't very interesting unless you can, you can somehow show another dimension of a character that what, you know, Hitler and, Hitler, and then fictionally Milton Satan are the most interesting characters because they're the most complex. And what we're, we're fascinated by the fact that, God, I can't believe I'm talking about Hitler, that, you know, that Hitler did have a dog that he liked, and that Satan was an intelligent creation, an intelligent creature. And that, and Iago, you think of Shakespeare as Iago, another character who, who was complex, and, and Iago had a wife. And so at some point, Iago loved a human, another human being. And so we're, we're fascinated by that. And I, First, I used to demonize my bad characters, and my good characters were so good, I never let them do anything wrong. And, but that seemed so untrue to life that after a while I began to, to f discover that human beings have an incredible capacity for both good and evil. And I think what, what defines someone as, as so-called good is the, how much they can resist the evil <laughs> within their own natures, and vice versa. I think that, that evil is, is um, or darkness in a human being, which is certainly, you know, there in all of us, has to be resisted. And when, it, when someone gives into it they, they begin, and begin to embrace it, that gives their character that turn. But there's always the other side that they're capable of. And all of this, of course, comes from the fact that, to me, I see human beings as driven by desire by yearning, by their own private passions, sometimes so private that we, we aren't aware of them. But every human being I've ever encountered, if you spend enough time with them, they're passionate about something, they want something in life so desperately, or they wanted it and they've been denied it. But that's the source of all this yearning and desire, and I think that's where my characters are coming from. I, I've always felt that it's kind of my job to not let any character drift along flat, you know, uninteresting, you know, to me, characters are, are, are there in, in books because we want other human beings to see us, to see us more fully, to recognize our humanity, and to recognize, even if it's a tiny splinter of humanity, <laughs> that there was a moment when this supremely evil, dark person grieved or, or felt something. And I, I think that makes, that improves our capacity for, for humanity when we can recognize that, even if we condemn the, the terrible things people do. Um, there's a lot of space here. That's why I came back. I just came back this fall, 
And one of the things that has drawn me back um, is the idea of the, the planes and the space. It's, there seems to be a lot of room, unfettered room for the imagination. And I think there's a, there's a lot of educated people here. And one thing that struck me when I was doing uh, research on my novels out in, set in the Sand Hills was the number of people who were reading and reading serious literature. Not just, not just fiction, but nonfiction, and reading things that one would not expect us to, to find. Um, and I remember going into little cafes out in Sand Hills towns, and there'd be some cowboy sitting there reading a book. And all around, when I looked, there'd be people reading books. And pe whatever I got to know some people, they wanted to talk about books. And I realized there's, there's serious reading going on here. And I think when you have a, a great number of readers of any thing, then you have writers. And writers, because writers need an audience, they need an atmosphere um, in which to create. And I don't think people, I, f I feel completely at ease here. I don't feel as if um, there's any sense of I need to write about a certain subject or I need to take on a certain kind of material or I can't write about certain things. I think it's very, very open here. And that's good. Maybe it'd be harder in, with a lot of large cities kind of defining culture. But here the culture seems fairly open. I don't think anyone's bothering anyone. And maybe that's the key to Nebraska. <laughs> as long as you just mind your own business, everyone else minds theirs too. <laughs> good, good for artists. Very good. I feel so lucky to be a part of this. One of my dreams always was to, to have my home state recognize me as a writer. And it's kind of like your parents finally saying, you did well. <laughs> and that's what we kind of strive for as adults, I think, to, to hear those words finally about our lives. And so I wanted to read the Sandhills novels, which explore uh, ranch life and the, the difficulties that families face in these isolated ranching um, experiences and the, the toughness on the, the kids and on the women particularly. And I, I think the, the adult men suffer tremendously from this experience too. And these novels are also exploring the difficulties of, it, of the culture clash between Native American um, experience and white experience. Um, uh, the Sand Hills bordering Rosebud and Pine Ridge reservations up there in South Dakota. So I'm going to be reading a couple of selections just to give you a taste of those novels. And then I'm going to conclude with a a uh, story from my new collection of stories called Taking the Wall. All of these stories are involved in, I hate to say this because I know people's minds go blank at this point, uh, automotive, <laughs> motorsports, I'll, I'll just say it, <laughs> motorsports, <laughs> demolition derby, Winston Cup, you know, the NASCAR stuff, um, the Indy cars, and it became an obsession of mine for a while when I was living in Michigan. And really, they're not just about sports. As you'll see from the reading, they're also about human relations and forms of dreaming that people have and small town life. So that's what I'm going to be reading tonight. the Indy cars, and it became an obsession of mine for a while when I was living in Michigan. And really, they're not just about sports. As you'll see from the reading, they're also about human relations and forms of dreaming that people have and small town life. So that's what I'm going to be reading tonight. Good evening. My name is Christine Pappas, and I'd like to welcome you to the Jane Pope Geske Heritage Room of Nebraska Authors, and this is the 125th reading in the John H. Ames Reading Series. The Geske Heritage Room is a special collection dedicated to preserving and promoting works by and about Nebraska authors, and currently we maintain a collection of over 11,000 authors and over, or excuse me, 11,000 volumes by over 4,000 authors. And in a special effort to promote the literatures of Nebraska, the Geske Heritage Room, along with the Nebraska Literary Heritage Association, Association sponsors this John H. Ames reading series. Um, our reader this evening is Jonas Agee. Uh, Jonas Agee believes that ecstasy and hard work are the basic ingredients of writing. She was born in Omaha and has returned to Nebraska this year to be become a professor of creative writing at the University of Nebraska. 
AG was educated at Iowa, where she received her BA, and SUNY Bingham, Binghamton, where she earned her MA and PhD. Also, she, although she writes about Midwestern themes, AG's fiction has garnered national acclaim. Three of her books, Strange Angels, Bend This Heart, and Sweet Eyes, were named notable books by the New York Times. She has also earned an NEA grant in fiction and a Loft McKnight Award of Distinction. AG's most recent books, both dating from 1999, are Taking the Wall, a collection of short stories published by Coffeehouse Press, and The Weight of Dreams, brought up by Viking. Jonas AG proves repeatedly that she knows the landscape of the West as well as the psychology of its inhabitants. Her intense characterizations press to the very corners of human sorrow and happiness. It is with great pleasure that I introduce Jonas AG. Well, thank you so much. It's wonderful to be here tonight. I, I think that we're so lucky to have this room and this organization to support us. This doesn't happen in every place, believe me. And it it's, just feels like a, a welcoming home to come here tonight. I thought tonight I would start with my two Sandhills novels, since we're from Nebraska and we're living here, and this is what we do. <laughs> so I'll start with um, a section where my two main characters, Cody and Lotta, the chapter's called it's very cunning, Cody and Lada, and uh, they get together for the first time, if you know what I mean. And then they get together some more throughout the rest of the novel. Uh, this novel's placed out in, I think, Cherry County would be a good guess, or someplace like it. And um, it involves two ranching families. Cody is the illegitimate son of Haywood Bennett, who has a very large ranch, and Lada is the widow of the man who ranched next door. And she's 10 years older than Cody. And um, Cody is a, is a person who lives on the land. He, wasn't, he was home educated by his kind of crazy mother, Carolyn. You'll meet her briefly in here. And Lot is a woman who's, after her, her bad marriage, has spent the last 10 years being alone, just trying to recover. And she's raising horses now, along with her cattle. And they're not really meant for each other, but in fact, they do find each other, which is the way most love works, I think. Driving back through town on their way out County Road 11, Lotta pulled into Jose's drive through line. By the way, I forgot to tell you, the one thing I discovered in the Sand Hills was that you could buy mixed drinks with your tacos at a place like Jose's, <laughs> which surprised me, that and the amount of liquor sold at gas stations. She said she wanted something to dilute the alcohol they'd had Cody could tell that what she really wanted was to dilute the other thing that was alive and awkward in the front seat. He was watching her from some distance, as if the seat had stretched out another three yards and he could barely touch her, even if he wanted to. He was half propped against the open window, his right arm framing it, his hat shadowing his eyes, his legs splayed. His left arm rested along the back of the seat and he could feel the heat of her cheek on his waiting hand. As he idled in line, she glanced at the pale hairs on his tanned wrist, his long, beautiful wrist, exposed by the turned-up cuff, the kind of wrist that made her, heart, made her feel her heart break. Men's bodies did that to her, she'd discovered at 17, when Jawboy's short, powerful legs and hard, round belly had broken her heart, too. A piece of flesh or bone would call to her, and she'd stare. But it had been a while. She wondered why he didn't say anything. She worried that she was mistaken about what he wanted. Can I take your order, please? Lotta stared at the panel of pictures and words, faded to ghastly neon yellows, oranges, and greens that made the food impossible to imagine as edible. Four soft shells, extra sauce, and two large margaritas with covers, his voice directed softly. When she turned back, he smiled and let his body open and relax. He watched her body turn jerky with awareness. She had trouble shifting out of park to roll the truck toward the pickup window until he reached over and started the engine for her. Her shoulder, her breath that close, made a soft heat rise in his stomach. Fumbling with the change, the bag of food and the carton of drinks at the window, she let him reach across her, his arm brushing her breasts, and take the food while she pressed herself thin against the seat back. He wanted to calm her, to say something to help, but he couldn't. So he tried to slow his own body, 
put it under water, breathe as if he were falling asleep, ease the wild energy rising hysterically in the cab. If she would only let it happen, they would be drawn like two sleepers along a dream. She smelled his sweet whiskey breath in the other, the soap and sweat and something else, horsey and male. Here, she handed him the wad of bills and coins, accidentally letting them spill out onto the seat before he could grab them. You okay, he asked as she put the truck in gear and inched forward. She nodded. Was she going to take him home with her or not? He couldn't ask. What words would he use? Hey, you want to go to bed? I've been thinking about you for five days since you got your tractor stuck. You want me to drive, Mrs. Jawboy? He kept his voice cool and quiet. She shook her head. She had to make this decision herself. She wasn't going to let him do it for her. She pulled on to 20, almost bumping the rear end of a downshifting cattle truck. Music, he asked between sips on his drink. They both tried to ignore the leaking, grease-stained white bag between them that was filling the cab with the smell of lukewarm, refried beans, cheap meat, and taco sauce. She shoved a tape into the player. Emmy Lou Harris's sad, haunting voice wound itself around their heads and chests. Lada couldn't quite catch the rhythm enough to hum with it. Cody studied her, studied her, trying to see and memorize everything, the way he always had to, because he'd learned a long time ago that everything vanished, except in your own mind. He saw the angry burned arm, the way her shirt was a little faded and damp under her arms, the way her nose wasn't straight. If you looked at the nostrils from below, one hole would be bigger than the other. The beginnings of those lines from the nose to the mouth and the ones around the mouth. Again, he noticed she had those small creases around the eyes that you got in the hills by the time you were 20 from squinting against the blowing sand, sun, snow, and sky. In the fading light, he could just see how her skin was starting to get that matted look with hundreds of fine lines like a piece of cowhide. Carol and his mother had laughed at the way women got old like their handbags their shoes. Did Lotta see herself that way too? An old handbag of a woman no one could love? The young have no tolerance, his mother used to say. They don't overlook anything physical. That's the problem, she would told him. But he didn't mind the way Lotta's thighs were a little heavy, making the material of her jeans rub and wear white between her legs, though she rode horses every day of her life. As if she could feel his scrutiny, she took a quick breath and stepped harder on the gas, pushing the truck into the curve, catching some gravel with its rear end and wobbling as it slid out. She straightened the wheels and let her foot off. He was glad when she slowed. The winding road was full of deer this time of night. He knew that things wouldn't be so bad if he'd just say something. How hard would that be? She probably hated men who did this, the strong, silent routine. She wasn't talking either. Probably thought he was too young or poor or dumb, some hillbilly. She wished he'd just reach over and grab her. She wished he was, she was tough enough to pull his tight little cowboy ass across the bench seat, crushing the tacos in the mail. Just put a hand on my knee, she urged silently. Maybe if she stretched her neck, rolled it in a circle like it ached, he'd take the hint and massage it. The turnoff for the Bennett Ranch was coming up over the next rise. He'd almost lost track of where they were. If she didn't take that road, they'd be going to her place. Should he ask? What if she laughed or said, no, she'd had a long day? Hell, he'd had a long day. By the side of the road, two sets of gold eyes caught and gleamed in the headlights. Dear, she slowed down, watching them carefully. They seemed content to graze where they were, walking along the ditch but that was a trick they had. Then they'd suddenly decide to spring across the road to the other side. So she oozed past, adding speed to the truck gradually, then gunning it. Over the hill and down the other side, the Bennett rode at the bottom, neither of them saying a word. She let the truck roll past the turnoff. His fingers touched her neck, just the tips at first, sending currents up his arm, down her back, making it hard for her to breathe. He inched closer, not much, just enough to rub her neck. 
She slowed the truck to the rhythm of his fingers, loosening the muscles, separating the strands of her hair, rubbing himself into her. Now their silence worked another way, letting them feel the night air blowing into the cab from the hills, sweet with new grass and spring flowers, and smell the dampness from the day's rain that climbed the hills and spread across the valleys in long scarves of mist the truck sank into and burst out of as the road rose and fell while the green glow of the panel lights seemed to blink and lead them like fireflies. She stumbled on the first step of the porch and he caught her arm and pulled her back against him. He felt like a shadow, a shape of her behind herself, dark and sensual, so full of her. She couldn't stand without falling and he was there to catch her lightness. She led him up to the one room she had never slept in with her husband or anyone. A strange room, all angles and curves from the patching on of a second story and an addition. A guest room, though she never had any guests. Antique double bed, too narrow to really sleep in with another person. Wait, she said, and went for candles, and remembered bourbon and glasses and water, and wondered if she should change clothes, make sandwiches, brush her teeth, her hair. Wait, she'd told him, and she filled her arms with things they would need for a long journey. Wait, and she was afraid to go back without something to offer him something more. What was she missing? What would be the one thing, a sweet something for the tip of his tongue? He was waiting. When he saw her arms full, her frantic eyes, he stood up and gently took the things, placing them on the floor. She was standing with empty arms when he laced her fingers with his and spread their arms against the wall, bending to kiss her. So long he was holding her up, and then he wasn't, and they slid to the floor mouths working slowly as if time were a jar of honey dripping in the pantry sun, each bright drop distilling on the metal tongue of the saucepan below. Each new place he touched, he did it slowly to ask permission. She felt so small and valuable against him. He was careful when he lifted her hips and brought her to him, rocked back on his heels and held her against him, rocking, rocking. He felt himself slip away, and she with him, to some smooth place where the voices stopped and the quiet breathed small, then not at all. Okay, that's the beginning of that. One of the things that writing books allows me to do is still believe in the possibilities of life. Because sometimes you just don't after a while. <laughs> but when you write it, somehow it seems truer, doesn't it? Yeah. Like when you read it. Okay. The Weight of Dreams picks up Cody and Lotter in it. They're having trouble. Again. <laughs> They're always going to have trouble. They're two intense people. But in this book, we meet uh, Ty Bonte, another intense person, who has committed a, a fairly bad crime as a young man, and he's had to flee from the sand hills and the ranch he loves, even though um, he partly leaves because he lives on that ranch alone with his father, who's a, who's a pretty brutal alcoholic, uh, something not unheard of in isolated worlds such as the sand hills. And he, he misses it terribly, but he does create a life for himself. He lives in Kansas. I don't know how anyone lives in Kansas, but they do. <laughs> Actually, uh, I started writing this book, and I was going, I wanted to write a book placed in Kansas. You know, and I, my family's from Missouri, and, and they had always hated people from Kansas, and I guess the people from Kansas hate people from Missouri, so it's kind of mutual. And uh, they, to their dying day, never had a good thing to say about anybody from Kansas. And I, my father's sister actually went to, she moved to, what is it, Prairie Village, Kansas. And even though it's part of Kansas City, which is part Missouri, I don't think that it, the family ever got over that. <laughs> Just having to write KS bothered them. And I, I admit, when you, have you ever gone across those border towns along Missouri and to Kansas? They aren't friendly when you come over there. But as you get deeper into Kansas, people get nicer. And I think it's because <laughs> they're still fighting that war. 
But I fell in love with the Flint Hills, and I wanted to write a novel set in the Flint Hills. And ding, if this character from the Sand Hills didn't end up going back home pretty quickly. So um, I don't know that I'll ever get that Kansas book done. I'll, I'll try and take some more people down there soon and see if that helps. But I don't know what to do about that. I guess they just wanted to be home. And um, Cody, um, not Cody, uh, Ty, what I'm going to read to you is he's just met this young woman who kind of, he's a horse trader. And horse traders, I don't know whether you, you've ever met any, but they're kind of rough and tumble guys often, and often involved in highly illegal activities because the Wild West is still alive for some of those guys, and they often travel with guns in their cars because who knows what's going to happen next. And um, I happened to get to know a couple of them, and this was pretty true to their <laughs> lives, but um, not that they're wanted by the law. But as you're going to see, Ty has a few problems, and this is before he returns to the hills. But he, as it turns out, he can never forget the sand hills of Nebraska, and I don't think anyone ever does who's been born there. All right, how many of you are from the sand hills? Yeah. Is it good or bad? Yeah, yeah. You don't till you go back. Yeah. Well, I didn't appreciate Nebraska till I came back. And then I left Omaha and came west, <laughs> which is, you know, people in Omaha don't, do you all know this? Yeah. I mean, for me, Iowa was escape. If you can imagine Iowa being an escape for anybody. So, uh, well, it was east. You know, we thought we had to get east. <laughs> well, that was as close as I had a small world, you have to understand. <laughs> but um, my biggest thrill of coming back here is, is retrace. I, I would get on my horse at, at my grandfather's farm at 78th and State, and I would ride to 48th and Bedford where I lived. And riding your horse into town, you know, I always. I just took it for granted you could do these things, and now I think, my God, what were my parents thinking, or anybody, that they would allow this kid to walk around on a horse into, you know, main part of Omaha? But, but, um, well, it was kind of cool if you were a kid to do that. You know, all the neighbor kids envied you briefly, and then you went back and they beat the crap out of you again because you, know, you were this kind of person that was loathsome, bragging about having a horse. Okay, so it was only a hundred dollar horse. We didn't have much money. <laughs> when he wasn't running away, he was pretty safe. Okay. So this is this is Ty, and he has just picked up a load of horses up in Minnesota, and he's coming back, and he's also this young woman, Dakota, has shoved her horse on the load, too, and says she's going to Iowa, and you'll see what happens there. And he's, um, this is the first glimpse you get of the crime that he's committed, that he's, the rest of the novel is involved in, and that's what draws him back to the Sand Hills in part. Leaving Eddie's farm, he pulled onto the county road and started to plan his route home to Kansas after dropping Danny and Shakopee at the track. There was always that jaunt through the corner of Nebraska, no matter how he sliced it, which meant driving extra careful and not stopping, especially for the way stations where his license would be checked and the warrant could pop up. He listened carefully to the CB through Omaha to Lincoln and south to Kansas, and sometimes spent hours in rest stops waiting with the rest of the outlaws for the way stations to close. State cops along I-80 were tricky, too. One time outside North Platte, they put up a sign saying, mandatory drug search 10 miles just before an exit ramp and then searched all the vehicles that made desperate dives off the highway. <laughs> this is a true story. State court threw out the arrests, of course, entrapment, but it worked for a few days. When they dropped off Danny, they checked the horses again. The rank colt was dozing with his body pressed against the big brown gelding who watched them through half-closed eyes. Hope that colt keeps riding good, Ty said as they closed the small door on the van. At least that horse of yours has a decent outlook. Just don't drive like a cowboy and we'll be fine, Dakota said, and nestled herself into the corner with her head against the glass. Ty thought about how nice it would be to dump her in Iowa, except then he'd have to manage the colt alone. Well, it wouldn't be the first time, and it was sure a cheap enough horse to unload someplace and leave if it got to be too much of a pain. He looked over at the girl who already seemed to be drifting off before he, he could ask her where in Iowa she was going. It was the middle of the night by the time they circled the outskirts of Des Moines. Dakota had woken up at an hour before just long enough to tell him she wasn't stopping in Iowa, but going all the way to Kansas. When he tried to question her further, she'd muttered, whatever, and dropped off to sleep again. 
He'd lost a lot of time hiding out at a truck stop in Mason City until the cops closed shop, and now he was going to have to make the Nebraska leg in the morning unless he had to hole up again. Luckily, the horses were still riding well, even the colt. The long stretch from Des Moines to Omaha was a particularly dark and lonely drive up and down the deep, rolling hills with only Dakota's light snoring, the sticky hum of tires on asphalt, and the occasional static burst from the CB to keep him company. Something about the moon flooding the fields white in this stretch always reminded him of that January night with Harney driving up to Rosebud Reservation on the county road from Cody. It had snowed earlier and the wind was blowing so hard the car had bucked and weaved as it got hit broadside by the powerful gusts. The tires had hesitated on the snow-packed road, used only by cars fleeing the reservation all afternoon and evening for the stores and bars just across the border in Nebraska, then back again. Ty could still see the long white streaks of snow blowing across the road like fog, which made it impossible to believe anyone would be walking on a night like that. Then there they were, right in the headlights, staggering backwards into the wind, arms stuck out hitchhiking. Their heads were wrapped in rags, tying down the greasy gimme caps, and even in the dark and snow, their faces wore the unfocused look of drunkenness. Harney, driving, hit the steering wheel with the palm of his hand. Oh, yeah, he'd laughed and looked over at Ty. Let's take him. Ty pushed away the drowsiness the memory of that night always brought with it, as if he could sleep it away and return to his life before. Now the moonlight, moonlight made the leaves of corn glitter like rows of knives, guarding the land from the dark shapes moving across it. And in the distance, the rows marched up and over the hills like endless armies in perfect formation. The soybean and alfalfa fields alternated in dark plushness that seemed to disguise huge trap doors capable of opening and swallowing anything that dared move across their surfaces. At night, the land here changed, reaching back to its ancient ancestors like dreams leading to nightmares, where everything human is slaughtered and eaten. Ty had had these dreams and turned his eyes back to the safety of the white lines, wishing again and again that he were back in the sand hills, where the land used to welcome him at night. The soapweed stalks firm and resistant against the sky, while the grass clung in stubborn clumps to the thin soil. Having been away for so long, he understood the edges of that life, where to grow anything at all was a struggle, and in the struggle came some dignity and pride. Here, everything seemed to grow and flourish too easily. Minnesota, Iowa, Wisconsin, the flat, fertile regions of Nebraska and Illinois and Kansas, they made him nervous, as if any moment he would look over his shoulder and see the end coming at him. He looked at Dakota again, turned down the CB to listen for the horses and back, and satisfied, glanced at his side mirrors just as the flashing lights of a trooper swung up alongside. His stomach leapt and he gripped the wheel with both hands, resisting the sudden urge to swerve into him and eased off the gas. Preparing to downshift when the car swooped on past, swept up the hill and disappeared over the top. By the time they reached the top, the cop car was a pair of red pricks of light winking in a black distant sea just before it vanished. He exhaled, and the woman beside him murmured, that was close, then fell back to sleep. Well, he has a lot of brushes with all kinds of things. He's kind of an intense guy. But he has to go back and face his old man, as we all know, because it is, after all, fiction. <laughs> You didn't know that. <laughs> the last story I'm going to read you, because I think you've been patient and kind. I don't think I'll read you the, the suicidally depressing story. Would that be OK? <laughs> Just for a change of pace. I know this other stuff is so lighthearted. <laughs> you can hardly stand it. There actually is humor in my books. I want to warn you. <laughs> Some. I think it's funny. but. Who knows? My sister laughs because I bury little little secrets for her, you know, things from our childhood that we used to mock our parents for and things like that in the story so she can laugh. My mother had this stuff called Lumar, um, which, anyone know about Lumar? 
Well, she, you know, you know about Avon ladies. Well, she had somebody who sold like an Avon lady, only it was much rarer, not more expensive, but just rarer. So you could almost never get it unless, you know, you had these little appointments. And they sold this all-purpose cream that my mother, I suppose it was like cod liver oil for other people, only you weren't supposed to ingest it. But my mother gave it to us for pimples, cold sores, rough skin, uh, cuts, bruises. <laughs> Anything that ailed you, you got this green, grainy stuff called Lumar. And I kind of miss it now, you know what I mean? <laughs> and of course, when you add grease to greasy kid skin, it really doesn't help with the pimples. And it took us a while to figure out drying out would help better. But um, she was faithful to it all her life. And so my sister, and when I was writing South the Resurrection, she said, put Lumar in there. That's, I want you to put Lumar in a book. So, <laughs> so if you ever read South of Resurrection and you see the word Lumar, you're going to know it's his cream, even though it's the first name of a guy <laughs> <laughs> who appears once in the novel. <laughs> see, and those are the fun parts about writing. Okay. And this story is um, got its inception from a student of mine whom I particularly like, who went on to be a poet and um, a very good poet, and then went to Hollywood and she's writing scripts. And um, I don't know that any of them have been produced yet, but she's a wonderful writer. Anyway, she, of course, was the kind of person who would go to Memphis and do the Elvis tour bus. And so she came back with a picture of Elvis for me and the little tour bus stuff, as if somehow that magic and power would transfuse itself to me or whatever it's supposed to do. But I hung on to it, because I hang on to stuff like that. One day I didn't know what to write, so my eye lit on that tour bus ticket. And I thought, well, whatever I write, that has to be in there. So. Here goes, the trouble with the truth. I married a man who loves weddings, and all I have to show for it is the gold stub of an Elvis tour bus ticket. He just lost his job changing tires with the race team after he cracked a ball joint, dropping the car from the jack. It fell off as the driver headed for the track. Lucky was what they said. Could have cost us the race, maybe the car and driver too. This was the very sad story he told me that night a year ago in Billy's bar, getting drunk and watching video replays of old races on the TV, mounted in the corner with the sound turned off, and the handicapped words printed in white across the bottom. When did they decide people need to watch TV while they drink? I asked him. We nursed our seven and sevens till closing time and haven't been separated since. Until now, that is. I pick up the Elvis tour bus ticket and put it in the same box as the plastic bride and groom from the cake my cousin Mavis baked. Five years ago, Mavis went all the way to St. Paul, Minnesota for the Votech cooking course, but quit after ice sculptures and wedding cakes, her two specialties which supplement Lonnie's income as an over-the-road trucker. He's such a good Christian, he won't take hauling jobs that don't serve the Lord, so he spends a lot of time at home watching the 700 Club and eating pretzels in a slow, almost demented way, <laughs> and drinking water. You'd think it was an Arab, Mavis complains. Mavis is also Christian and tucks little crosses into her creations, regardless of how the customer feels about it. It's become a game at receptions to find the crosses on the ice swans and sailfish, or the three-tiered cakes bogged down by clumps of bright, unidentifiable flowers. Mavis only got a C- minus on the cake section, she told me one day. But that was prejudice on the part of the instructor, who was a man. What did he know about cake baking? What Mavis is good at is texture and flavor. My own secret ingredients, she smiles whenever anyone comments. My cake was cranberry apple flavored, and the crosses sat deep inside the red and yellow clumps supposed to be roses, but resembling oranges instead. <laughs> The crosses themselves were hard white sugar creations made in moles Lonnie ordered off a Christian shopping channel as a surprise when Mavis opened her business. For Easter and Christmas, Mavis makes cross cakes with little three of those little white little sugar crosses standing in a row along the cross beam and gives them to all her family and friends. Sometimes it feels more like a burden than a gift. The man who loves weddings acted like Dracula when he saw the first cross cake and refused to enter the kitchen again until I hid it. He's as bad as our dog Frank, who is so afraid of pigs that the day I brought home the big black plastic pig bank I'd won at the auto parts store where I work, he scurried out of the house and hid under the porch. 
I've had to hide the pig just like I hide the cross kicks when they arrive. Maybe it's a guilty conscience, I decide after I meet his other wife, Doris, in Osceola a month ago. How many wives does a man need? I yell, and he tells me the other one is an accident. <laughs> accident? No, a car hitting a tree is an accident, I correct him. And that actually sends him out to look for a job, something no amount of nagging has been able to do. Working at the garage, he'll be able to file for divorce from his other wife and me both. We're going to get married again as soon as he's done with all the legal work he's promised. And that will give him three weddings in a row, I calculate. But there lurks in my imagination the idea that other wives could pop up. Other women and weddings he's forgotten about as well. I suppose you were drinking that time too, I asked sarcastically as we sit in the booth of the big chef waiting for our burgers. He gets that pig-worried dog expression on his face and shrugs. He's a small, compact man, almost good at a lot of things Doris and I have discovered. Maybe he did marry her in the accidental mood of the moment. He has a lot of those. In the garage, they can barely trust him to change the oil, patch a flat. He only keeps the job because I give them discounts on their parts at the auto store now. On our honeymoon to Graceland, he somehow broke the light fixture in the tour bus bathroom, and the rest of the way, people could be heard thumping and cursing in the dark as they peed. He started bigger in life than where he is now. That much Doris and I do know. But his story is as much a history of mistakes as weddings. Once, when he made it all the way to Bush Grand National Cars, he reversed the camber on the tires at Martinsville. Instead of getting full layover on the corners, the car slid up under the wall. Well, anyone can make a mistake, he says. Doris and I know there is nothing like a man in trouble to win a woman's heart. Look at Mavis and Lonnie. Look at Jesus. Look at Doris and me. It might be better if he took up religion, I tell Doris, when we meet at Billy's Bar. Turner's Garage is born again. I guess it wouldn't be the worst thing that could happen. We both stare at our rum and cokes with little bubbles strung like beads up the sides of the glasses. Doris is my height, 5'5", five, five, and medium build like me. We could be cousins sooner than Mavis, who is a too tall blonde with none of the fun in her ankles. We're serviceable types, Doris and me. We're the women pushing kids into cars, shoving grocery carts down aisles, working behind counters. We don't ask, how could I be so blind? Our vocabulary is limited to things like, what should I do with the wedding photo? When do I change my driver's license? How do I tell my family? Looking at the two of us, no wonder he made a mistake. Forgot he already had a wife. Like buying a second bag of flour, a book you've already read. People forget. And he loves weddings. Desire like that can override just about anything, I guess. Doesn't necessarily make you a bad person. Someone punches in some George Strait, who I have never particularly liked. His songs having the same qualities as his face, good-looking and bland. <laughs> what we need here is some outlaw music, some Steve Earle with his junked-up drunk voice chasing the words that come stumbling along a little too fast for him. Even in the sad songs, he sounds both mad and about to burst out laughing. There's something about right now that makes me feel the same way. Doris and I heard about each other by accident from Mavis, who got an order for the same cake I had at my wedding. Seems Doris's four-year anniversary is coming up, and he'd fallen in love with that cranberry apple flavor from our cake. He gave her Mavis's number. So we're meeting for the first time here. I thought he was at the track those weekends, I say. Doris looks at me with these blue eyes that say, rain is coming down inside here, honey. Do you think there are others? Wives, I mean. She's been so surprised by the first second wife that I don't think her mind has traveled to that next rest stop yet. Neither of us has children. Neither of us smokes, though all around us the air is cloudy from the drinkers lighting up and blowing their exhausted day into the dark room. Billy's has knotty pine walls so old the varnish is orange and a brown linoleum floor so dotted with black cigarette burns it looks like the original pattern. Set off the road, there's a sprawl of gravel parking lot in front so everyone can see who's here. 
I personally know four or five different guys who park their pickups at the used car block, lot a block away and walk over so their wives don't find them here. It's late afternoon and outside the sun is shining like some holy war is about to begin. And the way it stabs through the holes where the black paint is peeled off the front windows, you'd think it was the Almighty himself pointing, finger, pointing fingers at all of us crouched down in dark safety here. I try to imagine the cake doors orders showing up tiered with crosses marching to the top like tiny soldiers. Scare the bejesus out of them. You remember that time he worked as the gas man at Watkins Glen? Doris stops and takes a drink. I nod. That wasn't his fault either. They told him to get every drop in and it splashed back into his eyes. She looks at the table, brushes the scarred green formica with her hand and looks at the jute box. Wonder who he married that time. There is this instant picture of the race at Daytona where he lost the thread chaser and they couldn't fix the stud while the other cars raced around and around like sonic zippers. I drain my rum and coke and raise two fingers. We're both going to need more. I guess we should be mad or something, but I'm not pissed off. Not at you anyway. I guess I'm not mad at him either. What do you suppose that means? She shrugs and finishes her drink, using the tip of her tongue to lick the ice cubes clean. I'd done that same thing a moment before. When you get down to it, we're all pretty much alike, it seems, and that makes the hair-thin differences important. Maybe that's what he notices. And while it looks like what he's doing is buying the same shirt over and over, what he's really doing is falling in love with these tiny differences. I could probably pick us out of any crowd we'd be so alike, but he'd know the truth, how each of us has come to stand in the sorrow of time. So Doris and I sit here a while longer, watching the sun go down through the holes in the painted window, the fingers of light slowly pulling back until all that is left is spread on the gravel parking lot, pink, then gray, then the yellow-green of the fluorescence coming on. On the jute box, a CD sticks, making a snap snap like a bug zapper for half an hour before someone notices. Doris and I watch the endless negotiations of the men and women at the surrounding tables in the bar. After a few more drinks, they begin to remind me of cars racing around a track, bumping and pushing, running close enough side by side that could carry on a conversation, if not for the roaring engines. There is so much noise here tonight. Doris and I have to repeat each word in a shout and find our sentences getting shorter and shorter until finally we only gesture and nod. We get grace this way for a few minutes, the perfect understanding that can come briefly when two people are drawn and held with enough force to a single place. I figure the man who loves weddings must recognize how irresistible we all seem to each other at moments like this just before our world dissolves again with another crashing disaster. He never says mistakes were made. He calls them accidents. And it's hard to hate a man like that. That's the trouble with the truth. <laughs>